uh, we're up to question four now in uh, the June 2009 DY1 uh, paper. Uh, question four here is uh, uh, really a, a couple of topics uh, in one question. Uh, it's about uh, biological membranes or the cell membrane, uh, but later on it also asks you uh, about protein structure as well, which uh, which is pretty logical really because uh, there are proteins within the uh, cell membrane. Okay. Uh, so the examiner is telling you that the diagram uh, down down there represents a model of a biological membrane. This model has been described as a phospholipid C with protein icebergs. Okay, um, so let's have a look at the uh, the diagram itself. Um, a lot going on here. Um, basically, if I highlight uh, some points here, this uh, let's change the colour of the pen. Is it? This uh, region here uh, is actually a, a protein uh, embedded uh, in the membrane. Now, uh, that protein would be classed as uh, an intrinsic protein because it is embedded within the uh, membrane. Okay, uh, the protein next to it um, again, it's a, a protein embedded in the membrane but it actually goes all the way through the membrane okay so it, it is it is an intrinsic protein um, but it's also classed as a transmembrane protein as well because it goes completely through uh, the bilayer okay um, the examiner here has actually put uh, charged uh, symbols um, around various parts of the protein Okay, they're uh, very important, and uh, I have made reference to uh, charges um, on proteins in my membrane structure notes. Okay, uh, basically, uh, any any region of a protein that's charged uh, means that it cannot interact with the hydrophobic tails uh, of the cell membrane. Okay, if I just uh, point out to you that of course these are the hydrophobic tails uh, of the cell membrane of the phospholipids okay now they're water hating or hydrophobic and uh, it's only um, non-polar or non-charged regions of a protein that can actually interact uh, with those um, hydrophobic tails Okay, uh, the charge regions uh, of the membrane um, are located really outside of the membrane, okay, or just in contact with the uh, phosphate heads of the phospholipid. Uh, so this region here, uh, which I'm circling now, is the hydrophilic or water-loving uh, head of the phospholipid. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's scroll down then and look at uh, question A1. Uh, name the model proposed by Singer and uh, Nicholson in 1972. So those two scientists uh, actually gave a name to this model that we use to represent the uh, the structure of the cell membrane. Okay, and of course the uh, and of course, the um, name is the uh, fluid uh, mosaic model. Okay, so uh, let's move on then. Uh, A2, select a single phospholipid molecule in the diagram and label the part which is hydrophilic and the part which is hydrophobic. Um, so I've sort of uh, mentioned that uh, a moment ago, but uh, just label it really. The uh, phospholipid heads here, the part I've labelled uh, with a red arrow, okay, they're going to be the hydrophilic regions, they're going to be water loving, okay, so I've just arrowed it there, but of course, remember to actually write down uh, that they are the hydrophilic uh, regions of a phospholipid, okay. Um, next then would be the um, hydrophilic 
regions. So they would be the tails there of the phospholipids. So again, remember to label uh, that hydrophobic region there. Okay, so that's the answer there to part uh, two. Okay, uh, part B then. Um, this section now is really looking at uh, protein structure. So uh, the examiner says the proteins are drawn to give some indication of their tertiary structure, um, which they are. I don't know whether you noticed that. I can uh, highlight that for you. He says they're drawn to give some indication of their tertiary structure. Um, basically, if I circle that region there, that actually is uh, an alpha helix there. Okay. Um, I would probably imagine that this region here would be a beta pleated sheet okay and what the examiner has done is that he's shown that those secondary structures okay uh, an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet are secondary structures where they have become uh, folded again and compacted to form this overall tertiary structure Okay, so the diagram does represent uh, to some degree a tertiary structure of a protein. Okay, um, so the question is um, explain the difference between secondary and tertiary structure of a protein molecules, including reference to the type of bonds involved. Okay, so uh, this is worth four marks here. Okay, and uh, again, this is really a, a question of. Um, uh, recall uh, where you just sort of state the differences between these secondary and tertiary structures and of course mentioning the all-important bonds there's lots of bonds uh, present in um, uh, proteins okay which you need to uh, remember so I'll type an answer in here uh, and then we can uh, discuss uh, what I've written okay so uh, there's my answer I've uh, stated there that the secondary structure is the folding of the polypeptide chain to form an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet. Uh, the polypeptide chain, of course, is the uh, primary structure, isn't it? Okay, the primary structure is just the, uh, the sequence uh, of uh, amino acids joined by peptide bonds. All right, so that polypeptide chain will fold to form an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet. Uh, those two structures are held together by hydrogen bonds. Okay, uh, so that's really all you can say about the secondary structure. So on to the tertiary structure, which is just the further folding of the secondary structure to form a specific compact three-dimensional shape. Now you have to mention specific because proteins have specific jobs to do and uh, it's the tertiary structure really that allows them to do that job. Uh, so the, the, the shape and the structure has to be quite specific. Uh, it's compact uh, because all of the polypeptide chain and all the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets um, fold in on itself and the, the whole molecule becomes very, very compact. And it also becomes three-dimensional then uh, as well. Uh, lastly then I've mentioned uh, disulfide ionic and hydrophobic bonds uh, hold the tertiary structure together. Okay, uh, when you're asked to make reference to bonds, you, you should quote, uh, you know, as many as you can, really, uh, the more the better. Um, you know, if I'd only mentioned one bond uh, in this um, answer, I probably wouldn't have got the mark for it. You do need to really quote uh, more than one, probably two or three, uh, in order to get the marks. Okay, so that, uh, that there is the question on uh, protein structure. Uh, so if we move on down now to part C, um, it's asking now with reference to the diagram and your answer to part A2, uh, explain how the distribution of charged and uncharged parts determine the position a protein will take up in the membrane. Okay then let's, uh, let's just scroll back up to uh, the diagram at the beginning of the question there. Okay, um, I think um, when I initially talked about this diagram, I probably um, uh, mentioned most of the important points. But basically, in order for a protein to sit within the membrane, um, 
it has to interact with the hydrophobic regions of the membrane. Now, just to remind you again, this is the hydrophobic region here where the uh, tails of the phospholipid are. So, um, wherever a protein interacts with the uh, fatty acid chains or the tails of the phospholipid, uh, there are no charges um, within the protein structure. So, the protein region there is actually non-polar. So, it has the same properties really as the um, uh, phospholipid tails. Okay, so you get hydrophobic, hydrophobic interactions there. Uh, wherever there's a charged uh, region of the protein, so we're looking at uh, the charges at the top there, uh, they interact with the hydrophilic regions of the phospholipids, which are, which are the head regions there. Okay, and of course, uh, down here on this transmembrane protein as well. Okay, so that's how the charges within the protein determine how the protein sits within the membrane. Just to remind you, wherever there's charged regions, they interact with the hydrophilic heads. Wherever there's non-charged regions uh, in the protein, they interact with the hydrophobic tails. Okay, um, so let's type that answer in. Okay, so uh, there's the answer. I've said charge groups in the protein will associate with the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipid. Uh, and the uncharged groups uh, will associate uh, with the hydrophobic uh, tails. Okay, a couple of uh, typos there. Okay, so that's the answer uh, to part C. Uh, moving on um, to the last part of this uh, question. It's got there, um, the diagram below shows another protein. Okay. Now, uh, this protein is different uh, to the one shown in the uh, original diagram because the protein has charges all the way around um, the protein uh, surface. Okay, um, The proteins within the membrane, if I scroll up, uh, only had charge regions um, on either side. So at the top, okay. Uh, of the proteins and one right down the bottom there. Okay, um, so the protein now drawn uh, here is very different. It has charges all the way around it. And it's asking now, suggest how this protein would position itself in the membrane for one mark. Well, because it's got charges all the way around it, um, it cannot interact with the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid. All right, there are no uncharged regions that would allow it to actually insert directly into the membrane. Uh, so this type of protein will actually form uh, an extrinsic protein where it would actually sit on the surface uh, of the phospholipid uh, layer. Um, if I just draw um, a simple uh, shape here to represent that, so the protein would actually sit right on the surface there. And that now would be an extrinsic uh, protein. Right, let's type that answer in. OK, so there we go. I've said the protein would associate with a hydrophilic head only. So would be an extrinsic protein. And so would be positioned on the surface of the uh, membrane. OK, and that's, uh, that's the end of uh, question nine. If uh, we have a quick look at the mark scheme, um, question four. Um, there's the answers there. Okay, I think part A is pretty uh, straightforward. Part B there, um, the only thing I didn't put in the answer. Okay, there is an option here to talk about uh, the R group. Uh, that's quite important. Okay, uh, you need to remember that the bonds like disulfide bonds and ionic bonds actually form between the R groups. Okay, uh, of the amino acids. So you could have put that one in. Um, but uh, we mentioned all the other points. Um, I mentioned uh, disulfide, ionic, and hydrophobic, and hydrogen bonds in my answer. Uh, we could have had salt bridges, or we could have had covalent uh, as well, but we mentioned uh, at least three. 
Um, scrolling down then, part C, um, I think the, uh, the answers there are uh, quite um, straightforward. Okay, so that's the, uh, the end of uh, question uh, four.